Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, rank and file police officers in England and Wales say that rising workloads and shrinking budgets mean they're increasingly being obliged to work alone, putting themselves and the public at potential risk. And nearly two thirds of officers surveyed said they had suffered a traumatic experience in the last 12 months. Paul McNamara reports from the West Midlands. It's 2 a.m. and PC Martin Hodnett is about to stop a car suspected of taking part in a burglary. He's not expecting this. To add to the terror, PC Hodnett is in the car, out on patrol, alone. And new figures released today reveal that is happening more and more often. Three by the three by the urgent. They've, uh, they've ran me and attacked me with a sledgehammer. Policing numbers are so low now, some communities are helping police themselves. Do you guys ever go out by yourselves? No. We're not, we wouldn't be insured to go out on our own. And so how many of you will go out? Uh, it's a minimum of two. For the last year, Chris, Anne and a dozen other voluntary members of Shirley Streetwatch have been patrolling this area in the West Midlands. Once we finished work, so, yeah, OK, we could just go home and sit down. But the police aren't around because they haven't got the numbers, they haven't got the resources. So any help we can give them is going to be a bonus for our community. You guys have to do this because there don't seem to be a number of police on the streets. How do you feel about it? Are you angry about it? I would gladly give this up tomorrow if they would replace me with a police officer. Gladly. But that's not going to happen anytime soon. So there are fewer police officers on the beat. Hardly surprising given that on average police budgets have been cut by almost 20% since 2010. Police stations across the country have been closed. In fact, what well, this building site used to be one up until it was sold and demolished a couple of years ago. But what's been revealed today by the Police Federation is the effect all this is having on police officers themselves and the potential risks that they now face. According to the Police Federation, since 2010, there are almost 22,000 fewer officers across England and Wales. In a survey of 18,000 officers, more than three quarters of frontline staff reported often or always working alone. Not surprising then that 90% feel there were not enough of them to manage demand. And nearly two thirds said they were exposed to a traumatic experience in the last 12 months. None of this is a surprise to the West Midlands Police and Crime Commissioner. He says he's lost 2,000 officers, a quarter of his budget, and central government is expecting more and more from his staff. Homicides uh, this year have grown by almost a third. We've got uh, sexual crimes, we've got domestic violence and knife crime all growing. We need officers on the ground to deal with those incidents. You, you need officers, but do you really need as many officers as you once had? Aren't there advances in technology that mean it's more efficient to do policing now? We've made huge advances in technology, and that's good. But, you know, crime's increasing. So, yes, we're more efficient. Yes, we can do more in each shift. But crime has changed, and I think the public, quite rightly, demand from our police more than they've ever done before. Policing, by its very nature, can be a dangerous job. The question for government is, how comfortable is it sending more and more officers out to face these dangers alone? Well, earlier I spoke to Dave Stubbs, a serving detective constable from Staffordshire with 19 years' experience on the beat, who also represents the Police Federation, which looks after rank-and-file officers. I began by asking him what impact the cuts are having on police safety. Policing is a dangerous job. Uh, there's no getting around that. We all know what we sign up for and we all know about taking risks. You know, uh, it is a dangerous job. You know, as police officers, we have to put ourselves, you know, in harm's way. But we've always done that on the understanding that the backup and support that we need will be there. You know, if, if an officer is at an incident and they need help, assistance will come, you know. Uh, but and now do you the feel reality... that? Do you feel confident that that is the case anymore? It's not, uh, and, and this is my point, it, it's not at all. I, say I spoke to a uniform colleague and, and the stress here that they are under, you know, is, is that they may be at a serious incident, a violent incident, uh, someone say with a knife, and they go there knowing that they are not sure whether uh, the backup will be there for them. Do, do you think this is having 
you know, a psychological impact on police officers? Uh, massively, uh, and I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit, uh, around 12 months ago, I referred myself into occupational help uh, occupational health for some for some counselling myself. You know, I, I never went sick. I never had to um, go off duty or anything like that. But I felt I was coming close to breaking the breaking point. You know, my, my wife's a police officer as well, and she noticed uh, the warning signs and really alerted me to them. I wasn't sleeping. I was getting headaches, constantly thinking about work off duty. You know, and, and it's not good. It affects your family life. And how have things changed over the last few years? You know, do you remember a time when it was much better resourced? I can remember the times uh, when, I, when I was on response where we used to be able to go out and proactively uh, look you know, for criminals uh, around our crime hotspots, you know, stopping and searching uh, people for knives, drugs, things like that. All that has gone now. You know, all we're doing is constantly just dealing with, with the demand and we can't cope with it. And when you hear, I mean, you must be, you know, we've all been part of those conversations where people say, well, I, don't, I never see a police officer on the streets anymore. What do you say when you're in those conversations? Uh, they're absolutely right. I, I, live in, I live in Staffordshire, you know, I, I, I'm a local lad. Uh, I can't remember the last time I saw a police officer out on patrol, you, you know, that's, that's not flying to, you know, passed on blue lights and sirens. Uh, that, unfortunately, it is the reality, and, it, you know, it's not unique to Staffordshire. Every force has been hit massively. I mean, to listen to the government, you know, they would say we're putting nearly a billion pounds back on the policing budget over the next year. We're putting more money into armed policing. Um, you know, the, and they say the police have got enough money. That's what the minister's about to tell me. Um, what should I say to him? Uh, I, I would say to the ministers, actually come and work... Uh, with the officers on the ground and actually see for themselves, you know, um, the resources aren't there. Uh, it's going to take a long time to repair the damage done to policing. We've lost so much experience. Officers are leaving the service, you know, which is a massive shame because th this isn't a job to most police officers. It's a vocation. You know, police officers are, are committed to helping the public and, you know, and doing their best for them. And it, it is really, really sad, um, the state of affairs that, and the state policing is now in. Well, I then spoke to Nick Hurd, the Minister for Policing, and I asked him whether the pressure felt by forces today was a result of those 20% cuts imposed by the coalition and Conservative governments since 2010. There are very good reasons why budgets had to be cut back in 2010. And yes, we have uh, lost uh, uh, 20,000 uh, police officers. But there were good reasons for that back in 2010 in relation to the need to get on top of the deficit. Uh, and at that time, demand on the police was flat and everyone uh, realised that, uh, recognised that there was room to improve the efficiency of the police. But that, we're in a different world now uh, in 2019. And as I said, my priority since being police minister has been to recognise that demand on the police has risen, that pressure on frontline officers who do a very difficult uh, demanding, often very dangerous work has increased and my uh, priority has been to uh, increase investment in our police system, get more resources into our police system, uh, encourage police and crime commissioners to recruit more officers and reduce some of that pressure. And alongside that, this isn't a new alongside thing. that invest in, 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 in new plans to kind of support the uh, mental and physical health needs of, of frontline officers which uh, frankly in the past had not been given enough priority. But what I'm saying with, you know, uh, very frankly, uh, is that uh, the world changed, started to change from 2014-15, and so when I came into this job in 2017, having, I said, spoken to uh, every single police force uh, in, in the country, it was very clear to me that my priority in the job was to get more resources into the system, take some of the pressure off, give better support to frontline officers who do a very difficult and demanding uh, job. So if it was clear to you that things were changing around 2014, why in 2015 did Theresa May tell the police fed that they were crying wolf? No, what Theresa May did in 2015 uh, uh, at that time was uh, to protect police uh, budgets. She told them they were crying wolf. Oh, but she also protected police budgets at that, uh, at, at, at that Having time. Having cut police numbers and, massively and by then, thousands. And since then... And since then, we've increased investment, so we're no longer cutting police budgets. This year, we'll be, uh, we're investing almost half a billion pounds more in our police system. Next year, as a result of a settlement I've taken through Parliament, we'll be investing uh, almost a billion pounds more in our police 
system. That has allowed police and crime commissioners uh, to do what the Fed, Police Federation and, and frontline officers up and down the country want, which is to recruit more officers to help take some of the strain uh, off, off the system, which is real, and I'm very, very honest about that. I've just spoken to a police officer who's told me, you know, he completely sympathises with members of the public who say they've never seen uh, a, an officer patrolling the streets. He, even though he's a police officer in his local area, doesn't see it either. Can you say to people that they can be confident that crimes will be adequately investigated and solved and that the police will be there when they need them? Because oh. he, as a police officer, was unable to say that. Well, what I would say to the public is uh, the, the risk of being a victim of crime in modern Britain uh, remains low. The overall crime is stable. We're obviously suffering and determined to bear down on a terrible uh, spike in the most serious violence, which is devastating its impact and very unsettling for communities uh, up and down the country. So we must have the right perspective uh, on crime. But demand on the police uh, has risen, and the government recognises that, recognises the pressure that the system is under. The reality is this, still, the economic reality, is that we are still constrained uh, by the public finances, uh, and there are competing pressures from schools and the NHS, and that's the economic reality that we're in. But this government has recognised the pressure on the police system, uh, is moving more public investment into the police system, is supporting the police leadership. Nick, thank you very much. Happy.